Thank you for joining us. I'm Felicity Ezewike. As the Nigerian Economic Summit Group Conference enters day two, regional and global leaders continue to focus on addressing the country's economic challenges in order to revitalize the nation's economy. Today's session provides a platform for stakeholders to engage in critical discourse on issues such as economic competitiveness, inclusive growth, economic reforms, and sustainable development. New Central's Omolola Ololade tells us more. The 30th Nigerian Economic Summit Group Conference has once again given Nigerians, particularly economic and financial experts, the opportunity to shine light on the country's economic challenges while preferring practical solutions to strengthen the nation's economy. The Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Wali Edu, emphasized the critical role of economic reforms in transforming the country's economy, hence the implementation of the government's major reforms, including the removal of petrol subsidy, which has brought hardship on many Nigerians. Clearly, government has had, as we have heard, to undertake necessary, but relatively uh, um, difficult reforms that have had a, an effect on the, co on the cost of living. However, Nigeria Country Director, World Bank, Ndiame Dio, said that while fiscal and monetary reforms is important, it does not rely on government revenue alone, but also on expenditure. Ndiame believes it is not all gloomy for Nigeria's economy, as it has been able to improve its GDP in the last one year. The projection now is that revenue to GDP is projected to increase from 7.6% to 10.5%. More than <laughs> 3 percentage point increase in uh, one year, it's unheard of. Frankly, uh, we've been working on these issues uh, across the world in many countries. Often when you do reforms and have one percentage point, you're very really happy uh, because it takes time to really uh, increase. Uh, Mr. Wally Edwin therefore mentioned that beyond these economic reforms, the government has made plans to boost its agricultural sector as a major driver to tremendously grow the Nigerian economy. Apart from ensuring by diligently working in particular with, with, with the uh, African Development Bank at this particular moment and other development partners to ensure that, the, that what remains of the wet season harvest will finally change wet season has sort of moved slightly, as well as the dry season harvest is successful, does produce bountiful food, which will reduce uh, uh, the, the, the cost of food and make it more available and affordable and bring down the rate of inflation. Because While economic reforms may be fundamental to ensuring Nigeria's economic growth, the average citizen would argue that the impact of implementing such reforms should be bearable for them. This expectation is one that the summit may have to take into consideration. In Lagos for News Central, I am Omolola Ololadi. Still on the summit, the Nigeria Liquefied Natural Gas Company says that there has been a reduction in investment in the oil and gas sector following the aftermath of COVID-19 and other environmental and security issues. The chief executive officer of the company made this known during a high-level panel which held on the sidelines of the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit holding in the nation's capital, Abuja, saying that this has led to less investment in exploration and development of the petroleum sector. New Central's Joshua Imarayi has more in this report. The engagement with oil and gas high-level panel, which was held on the sidelines of the 30th Nigerian Economic Summit, the workshop with the theme, Fueling Growth to the Future of Oil and Gas, saw the convergence of Nigeria's top investors in the oil and gas sector. The chief executive officer of the Nigerian liquefied natural gas company lamented the decreased investment in the petroleum sector, saying it has hampered exploration and development. Investment has slowed over the past decade within the upstream oil and gas sector. Coming out of COVID, I don't think the industry ever recovered. But coupled on top of the declining investment, there's also then been the security issue 
in the environment. Some stakeholders, however, express their views on calls for a reduction of the country's dependence on oil. Yes, we're talking about net zero in 2060, but we first got to understand what do we have as a people, you know, natural resources. In terms of the natural resources we have, what ranks the highest? Oil and gas. Um, you need oil to diversify out of oil. So we would indeed um, have to diversify as a country, but that doesn't mean we should neglect our oil resources. Oil will still be with us for quite a while. The call of stakeholders in the private and public sector to collaborate and tackle the issue of security affecting Nigeria's oil and gas sector. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarayi. To politics now, the River State House of Assembly, led by Martin Amawule, has declared the seats of Edison here, the Chief of Staff to Governor Siminalaye Fubara, and three other pro Fubara lawmakers vacant following their absence from sitting for 152 days. Making this known during plenary, Speaker Martin Amawule pointed out that Ehia did not properly write to inform the House of his new office, and as such, his seat has been declared vacant. Regarding Victor Okojumbo and the two others, the House held three separate votes to declare their seats vacant for absenteeism from sitting for 152 days consecutively without notification or permission in violation of the 1999 Constitution. Meanwhile, Speaker of the River State House of Assembly, loyal to Governor Fubara, Siminalaye Fubara, Victor Okojumbo, has restated the House resolve that the legislative seats of faction of Speaker Martin Amawule and 24 others remain vacant following their defection from the People's Democratic Party to the All Progressive Congress and must be filled through a by-election conducted by the Independent National Electoral Commission. Okojumbo, in a statement on Tuesday in Port Harcourt, explained that the 25 legislative seats were declared vacant on December 13, 2023, while the then legitimately recognized Speaker Edison here, and regretted that the Commission has been foot dragging on the conduct of by election to fill the vacant seats. He said that the inability of INEC to do the needful since December 13, 2023, has created room for unnecessary distractions from Amawule and his community of friends, and called on the Commission to discharge its constitutional responsibility to the people of the state. Still talking party politics, the new Nigeria People's Party in Kani State has suspended two senior officials, the Secretary to the State Government, Abdullahi Bichi, and the Commissioner of Transportation, Mohamed Digol. The suspension was confirmed by the State Party Chairman, Hashim Suleiman Dungurawa, who cited abuse of power, disloyalty and the creation of chaos within the party. The decision followed written complaints from party leaders in Bichi North, the constituency of both officials. This development comes amid a growing crisis within the party in the Bichi area with stakeholders at odds. The suspension is aimed at maintaining party discipline and resolving the internal conflict. Celebrated on October 15, World Student Day honors the former president of India, Dr. Abdul Kalam's dedication to education. The day focuses on empowering students and encouraging them to be future leaders and innovators. The 2024 theme, Empowering Students to be Agents of Change, emphasizes responsibility, perseverance, and the role of education in societal transformation. To look at the significance of the day, we're joined by Special Assistant to Delta State Governor on Students Affairs, Obaro Ega, Egagifo. Egagifo. I hope I got that right. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we understand the day is domiciled in India in commemoration of its 11th president. Why do you think it's significantly tagged World Students Day? Okay, I don't think my guests uh, can hear me. Uh, we'll try and make a reconnection in the course of this bulletin or perhaps subsequently.
Moving on on the news to security matters, the Nigerian army has underscored the need for its personnel to improve on activities aimed at defeating the multidimensional threats to national security. These were the words of the General Officer Commanding 3 Amod Division, Maxwell Corby Cantonment Joss, Major General Abdusilam Abubakar, during the opening ceremony for the promotion examination from the rank of Master Warrant Officer to Army Warrant Officer. New Centre's Chizoba Anyowe tells us more. This yearly event draws qualified candidates from all the formations of the Nigerian Army in the country to participate in this promotion examination. Hosting this event by the three division in JOS may not be unconnected with the relative peace that has been persistent on the plateau in recent time. Major General Abdusalam Abubakar is the host for this event, which held at the three division sports complex. Only the best can drive the efforts of the Nigerian army towards defeating the multidimensional threats to our national security. The need to tackle these threats underscore our participation in internal security operations in aid to civil authority. And hence, the need for the Nigerian Army to bring competent senior non-commissioned officers in the battlefield. Nonetheless, these master warrant officers, both male and female, numbering over 200, will be tested to prove their mettle in order to contribute effectively and efficiently too to the fight against insurgency in Nigeria. During the course of this exercise, will undergo medical examination to ascertain your fitness to undergo the rigors of the physical fitness aspect and the exercise in general. Other areas are weapon handling, current affairs, and general service knowledge, which will involve physical activities as well as written examination and oral interview. But let me assure you that Katie, the fairness and justice, shall be our watchword and guiding principle in the course of this exercise. We should not entertain any fear of the capacity, integrity, and sincerity of the members involved to accomplish this all important assignment on behalf of the As the 2024 promotion examination ends in two weeks, it is expected that successful candidates would become familiar with the high degree of skills and expertise needed to prosecute the war against terrorism. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba and Nui. The Nigeria police says that it has successfully rescued over 300 kidnapped victims and made arrests of over 10,000 suspects in connection to various crimes across the country in the last three months. The Inspector General of Police, Kayode Egbetokun, made this known in Abuja during a conference of senior officers of the force to assess the progress made within the period under review. He adds that over 400 firearms, with about 3,600 rounds of live ammunition and several vehicles, have been recovered. Recent statistics indicate a substantial decrease in crime rates in key areas, including significant strides in combating violent crimes such as banditry, kidnapping, armed robbery, and cybercrime. From July to October this year, the Nigeria Police Force successfully rescued 369 kidnapped victims, recovered 416 firearms of various mix, retrieved 178 vehicles, and seized 3,672 rounds of ammunition of different calibers. Additionally, a total of 10,852 suspects were arrested across the country. The national electricity grid collapsed again on Tuesday, plunging millions of people into darkness. The latest incident comes barely 24 hours after electricity distribution companies across the country 
announced the grid collapsed around 6.48 p.m., resulting in a loss of power supply across their networks. According to the discos, efforts are reportedly underway to restore power, but the recurring collapses has sparked frustration among citizens and businesses already struggling with the inconsistent power supply. Let's talk nutrition now. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has initiated an emergency food distribution program targeting approximately 4,680 malnourished children in Jere local government area of Boronu State. This initiative comes in response to severe flooding that has exacerbated food security in the region. New Central's Umaru Kirawa completes the report. A recent report released by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization indicates that 5 million people across Borno, Adamawa and Yobe states are at risk of acute food insecurity. Rukaya Usman, a lactating mother, narrates how she struggled to meander through the flood that devastated her community, leaving her with nothing, not even food. <laughs> In efforts to address the dire situation, the FAO is providing specially formulated nutritious food to address acute malnutrition, ensuring that vulnerable children receive the support they need to recover and thrive. This will be a kind of uh, our first uh, batch of intervention for, for the flood affected people. And this will be uh, for the 1,000 uh, household. Energy saving stops were also provided to about 1,000 households affected by the flood disaster. This is very much timely and is from response to the people of the area. And we also have full efficient stock alongside the charcoal that will be helped in using or utilizing to cook whatever that has been intervened by the Food and Agricultural Organization. So on behalf of Borno State Government and the people of Jere, local government, particularly for Shokari Ward, we are very grateful and we do appreciate and acknowledge the intervention. as we are taking care of uh, uh, humans the same way we are taking care of our uh, animals also. So we have a plan of uh, vaccinating about 4,000 uh, uh, animals within uh, JRLJ alone. And then also we have uh, a plan for the macro gardening uh, support where we are going to give vegetable uh, seedlings to some household with uh, homestead gardening kits. These efforts aim to alleviate immediate hunger and support sustainable living as families work to rebuild their lives after the disaster. In Jere for News Central, Umur Kirawa. Many thanks, Umar. The United Nations Children Fund has handed over 600,000 doses of oral cholera vaccines to the Boronu State Government to help in the quest to tackle the outbreak. Chief of UNICEF Medjugorje Field Office, Dr. Gerida Birukila, said the delivery of the second consignment brought the total near one million doses of vaccines supplied to the state government. Fatih Ali, Director of Disease Control and Immunization, Boronu State's Primary Health Care Development Board, appreciated UNICEF and other partners for their support. This is actually the second batch of a cholera vaccine. Around 400,000, well, sorry, around 300,000 doses were also already given, and we believe this actually uh, was one of the reasons that you, they were able to arrest the spread of cholera uh, in Bono State, especially in the IDP camps and in vulnerable population. Now, with this more doses, it's close to one million uh, doses, and that will go a long way to reach those who are at risk of getting cholera, given that. Uh, there is a bit of overcrowding. Uh, we have children, and that's why they, uh, they started prioritizing those who were at risk when we had fewer doses. But this one should be able to really 
uh, containing the spread of cholera. Then we acknowledge them for transporting the uh, cholera vaccine from Lagos to Borno states. The state has appreciated and we really appreciate their effort because UNICEF is one of the partners collaborating with the state and supporting the state 100%. So thank you very much for this. And then we have received 669, 569 doses of cholera vaccine. So we urge everyone to go to the nearest health facility to collect this vaccination. Staying in Borono State, stakeholders in Meiduguri, the state capital, have called on the federal government to ensure provision of safe learning environment free of violence, harassment or discrimination for girls. The engagement stressed the poor education and gender response plan, which is said to have resulted in to increasing number of out-of-school girls, particularly in the northeast of Nigeria. The stakeholders called on government to set up empowerment initiatives, invest in menstrual health management, and strengthen legal protection for the girl child. This, they believe, is one sure way of encouraging young girls to be in school for a better future. We've surveyed 640 households in Gwonge 1, Gwonge 2, and Budim communities. The results are alarming, as only 19% 19 of 2,723 children have been able to return to school after the floods, leaving a huge 81% of children still out of school. Among those children, unable to return to school are future leaders, of which the majority are girls within the age range of 8 to 12 years. We also found that 65% of families noted a lack of learning materials such as uniforms, books, and, um, and banks, along with, difficult, a lot, along with financial difficulty, difficulties as a result for their children not resuming back to school. While enrollment is crucial, it is just the beginning. We call on the government to address all the barriers that stop girls going to school, including provision of scholastic materials for all children whose homes were affected by flood. We advocate for the creation of educational environment that welcome and support the rights of girls to learn, lead, and decide. This includes providing resources for menstrual hygiene, safe transportation, security, and adequate facilities for girls to manage their menstruation with dignity. Beautiful young girl there. Let's go back to our earlier conversation about World Students Day, commemorated in um, appreciation of the 11th president, the former president of India, Dr. Abdul Kalam's dedication to education. Uh, let's um, speak to the special assistant to Delta State Governor on Student Affairs, Obaro Egagifu. Obaro, it is good to have you. Let's hope that the connection is much better now. I was going to just, I think I asked you then, uh, let me repeat, the World Students Day is domiciled in India. Um, what's the relevance for the rest of the world? All right, thank you very much. Good evening to you. I, like you rightly said, I, I hope you can hear me very well. Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Okay, okay good. You ask of the relevance of the, the World Student Day uh, as it relates to our country, Nigeria. You know, the World Student Day is actually a day set aside to recognize the impact of students in our day-to-day -day, uh, living uh, as a people. You know, it was actually uh, first of all started in India in recognition of their, one of their former president. But for us, or, or for me, uh, having been a former student leader and having been somebody that had been saddled with the responsibility to assist His Excellency on student affairs in Delta State, it, it is actually my belief that setting aside this day for students marks a, 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 great, a great deal for, 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 for those that are schooling in, in our country. If you look at the team for this year, the team says empowering students to be agents of change. When we talk about empowering students to be agents of change, we are talking about making students 
those that are in the school age now that are still schooling to be that agent of change that could be uh, change in their in their in their in their country, change in their state, change in whatever they wherever they find themselves in their career in their field of endeavor. So for me, it's it's an important thing for 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 those who are interested in the development of their young ones vis-a-vis -vis those that are schooling and those that are seeing the schooling age. So for me, it's an important thing and it's an important day for the Nigeria students to celebrate as well. Um, I know we also have International Student Day. That, I think that is sometime in November. Uh, what, what is the contrast here and how can these days push the conversation about improving education for the young? Okay, yes. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, there's actually an international day for students that take place around November, if I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm right. But, you know, in all this, it is actually not a contrast, but it's more or less like a, a, a similarity. They, all, they both have a, a similar background. Because looking at the day, you will see that it is a day that is set aside to mark studentship, to mark student role as this schooling in the four worlds of institution. It's a day that is meant to set aside for to, to remember them of their role in the society. If you watch these days, uh, if you look at this, uh, this year's uh, 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 theme, you will see that it talks about engineering a society, students being agents of social change. Last year, what, what was talked about is if even if you can, that's you should be able to do something different. But this year, we are talking about students being agent of social change. The team recognizes the impact that the young, younger generation brings to the table. The team for this year also, also recognizes the fact that the younger, there is no country that actually uh, significantly develops without the impact of their younger ones. So the day, in its essence, is supposed to be set aside so that those that are in charge of our policy in government and even those not, those not in the government, stakeholders within this sphere can realize the importance of that day and use it to speak to those who are still schooling. So it's relevant. It's, it's, it's not really in contrast, but for me, it's the, both days are supposed to be days that are set aside to talk about the issues that even concern uh, uh, students, issues that face our students in their classroom, issues that has to do with their safety, issues that has to do with how their curriculum are tailored, issues that has to do with the, the vices that happen in our campuses and all that. But for me, it, 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 for any nation or a sub-nation that is actually interested in development, it is a day that is supposed to be taken very, very seriously. And I'm glad that so many people, and indeed, here in Delta, we gave cognizance to it as right. a day that is set aside for students. Obaro, thank you for speaking with us. The Lagos State Governor, Babaji De Sonwulu, has inaugurated the Red Line Rail Project, a landmark transportation initiative. The governor officially flagged off commercial operations and took a ride on the train, stopping at key stations. The project, which commenced in 2021, promises to provide efficient transportation for residents. It described it as a promise made and promise kept. The Red Line Rail connects Oyibo, Yaba, Mushin, Oshodi, Ikeja, Agege, Iju, and Agbado, significantly improving mobility and fostering economic growth. Thank you for staying with us. Kenya's Deputy President, Rigati Gachagua, has suffered a legal setback as the High Court in Nairobi rejected his bid to stop his impeachment process. On Tuesday, the court dismissed Gatagoa's application to halt the Senate's impeachment proceedings scheduled for Wednesday and Thursday. In his ruling, Justice Chacha Mwita emphasized the need to uphold the principle of separation of power, asserting that Parliament must be allowed to carry out its functions without judicial interference. He further remarked that courts should refrain from assuming the duties of other branches of government unless absolutely necessary.
The judge also hinted that the matter could be assigned to a bench previously constituted by Chief Justice Kone, which is currently handling six other related petitions. Up next is business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. At the Nigerian Economic Summit, the Senior Vice President of the World Bank, Indermit Gill, while delivering an assessment of Nigeria's economic stability, emphasized the urgent need for the nation to navigate its current uncertainties and foster an environment conducive to innovation and sustainable development. The summit, themed Collaborative Action for Growth, Competitiveness and Stability, aims to address pressing economic challenges and promote inclusive growth. The Vice President's remarks underscore that without strategic collaboration among stakeholders, Nigeria risks exacerbating its existing economic crisis. The Nigerian reform are the same, and they are, one, learn from your policy mistakes, two, let markets determine the exchange rate, three, keep public debt sustainable, four, adopt oil price-based fiscal rules, five, make accounting and allocation of oil revenues fully, completely, painfully transparent. Six, devise a public investment program that promotes the diversification of the economy. Seven, above all, and this is the difference between the Norwegian experience and the Nigerian experience, stay the course. It might take a decade to reap the dividends, but if you stay the course, you will surely reap the rewards. Surely, as surely as night follows day. Now, that ends my history lesson. Uh, let's talk about today. So today, Nigeria is once again at the crossroads. It has begun to implement a far-reaching, politically difficult reform with national, regional, and even global repercussions. Without solid progress in Nigeria, the sustainable development goals that we all talk about will remain out of reach. Cocoa futures have surged by over 80% year on year, with more than 10% rise since October, as adverse climate conditions severely disrupt the harvest season for the world's top producer. In Ivory Coast, heavy rains, particularly in the southwestern region, have intensified since the final week of September. These downpours have not only hindered the harvest, but also complicated the drying process and delayed the transport of beans to the ports. As a result, cocoa futures prices, which were already on the rise, have surged further, lifting the year-to-date increase from 65% to over 80% amid global supply concerns. And that's all on Business News. I am Likon Onobanjo. It is a proud moment for Nigeria as former Lagos State Commissioner for Sports and Youth Development, Wahido Shodi, secures the top position at the Africa Table Tennis Federation. Onyechi Obaro brings us the details. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil. We go the extra mile. In the world of sport, former Lagos State Commissioner for Sport and Youth Development, Waid Enito Oshudi, has unanimously been elected as the president of the African Table Tennis Federation in the 2024 AGM of the Continental Body, holding in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. His election as the new ATTF Supremo means Oshudi is the only Nigerian now presiding over a continental sports body. Oshudi is the former Commissioner for Youth and Sport and Social Development in Lagos. Under his administration, Lagos emerged a global hub for table tennis, hosting the highly successful ECO 2012 National Sport Festival and introducing the International Sport Classic Series, which drew top players from across the continent. The support we've received today has been great, but more importantly, I think we've managed to build a good team. And this team will go ahead now to take charge 
and try and make things even bigger and better. You know, we must give kudos to the outgoing president. A lot of hard work done. Now it's time to bring table tennis to the fore in Africa. We're chasing sports like athletics, basketball, football. I think we can catch up with them. We have some ideas and we'll be bringing them in. A lot of young talent in Africa. This is the time that for us to help them get to the top of world table tennis. The Nigerian on the 17 women's team Flamingos conducted a final training session at the Santiago Stadium in Dominican Republic ahead of their opening match against New Zealand on Wednesday at the FIFA on the 17 World Cup. The Flamingos are aiming to start on a strong note and improve their chances of bettering the bronze medal finish at the last edition in India two years ago. We need fans, prayer, but we are going to give our best in this World Cup. Earlier today, the Nile Crocodiles of Sudan defeated Ghana Blacksters 2-0 in a crucial Group F encounter of the African Cup of Nation qualifiers played at Matai's of February Stadium in Libya, the same venue for the cancelled encounter between Nigeria and Libya, originally scheduled for today. Sudan's victory came through second-half goals from Ahmed Al-Tash and Mohamed Abdurrahman in the 62nd and 65th minutes, securing all three points for the North Africans, who are coached by former Blacksters player and coach Kwasi Apia. The loss put Ghana in the danger of not qualifying for the next African Cup of Nations, which will be hosted by Morocco, as they garnered only two points from four games, leaving them third in Group F. Angola currently tops the group standings. Elsewhere, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Senegal secured their sports at the 2025 African Cup of Nations in Morocco, after important wins in their qualifying matches on Tuesday. DR Congo continued their perfect run in Group H with a 2-0 win over Tanzania away in Dar es Salaam, while Senegal left it late to secure a 1-0 victory over Malawi, courtesy of a stoppage time free kick from Sergio Mane that sealed the tickets to the finals. Finally, in the world of sport, French football star Kylian Mbappe has reacted furiously to reports in Sweden that he is subject of a rape investigation with Swedish prosecutors opened on Tuesday. Mbappe has not been named by the authorities, but Swedish media all reported on Tuesday that the 25-year-old Real Madrid striker was the target of the investigation after going on a night out in Stockholm last week. Citing anonymous sources, one newspaper reported that Mbappe was reasonably suspected of the rape and sexual assault, the lower of the two degrees of suspicion in the Swedish legal system. Mbappe's camp have emphatically denied all allegations. And that's it in the world of sport. I am Onyunyechi Obaru. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. Tonight on Entertainment News, Lagos State High Court has ordered Martin Osse, also known as Very Dark Man, to remove defamatory statements and videos he posted about prominent lawyer Femi Falana, S.A.N., and his son, musician, Faust. The court also imposed a 500 million naira fine on Osse for libel and directed him to compensate the Falanas for the reputational damage caused. The defamation stemmed from posts Osse made on September 24, 2024, in which he falsely linked the Falanas to controversial figure Bob Risky. Justice M. O. Ido ruled that the statement were untrue and intentionally damaging to the public reputations of Falana and Fowles. In addition to the financial penalty, the court highlighted the continuing harm caused by the defamatory content, noting that the posts were still visible on OSA social media platforms. The ruling emphasized the importance of quickly removing defamatory material to prevent further damage. This case is a significant development in Nigerians' legal efforts to address online defamation and protect individuals from reputational harm in the digital age. A petition to prevent Chris Brown from performing in South Africa has garnered over 30,000 signatures in less than two weeks, led by the women's right group Women for Change. The petition launched on October 2nd as part of the hashtag Mute Chris Brown campaign urges South Africa's Minister of Home Affairs, Leon Schreber, to stop Chris Brown from performing in Johannesburg in December, citing his history of domestic violence. Brown is scheduled to perform at FNB Stadium, with tickets for both his December 14th and 15th shows selling out quickly despite 
sparked the controversy. The petition urges that hosting Brown just days after the global observance of the 16th day of activism against gender-based violence is an affront to women and girls affected by violence. Women for Change's executive director, Sabina Walter, expressed dismay at the decision, stressing that allowing Brown to perform in the country with high levels of gender-based violence sends a harmful message about the prioritization of fame over accountability. As of now, Chris Brown has not publicly responded to the backlash. That's all on Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment News in association with Glow Unlimited. That's all we have for you tonight, but before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Stakeholders have decried low investment in oil and gas sector at 30th Nigerian Economic Summit. A Maoli-led Rivers Assembly has declared pro-Fubara lawmakers' seats vacant, as Okojumbo insists defected lawmakers have lost their seats. FAO has launched emergency food aid in Boronu State amid increase in malnutrition. We also told you that court has dismissed Kenya's deputy president's request to halt impeachment. You can catch up on all the latest news on News Central Live on DSTV Channel 422, on Star Times Channel 274, on Abo TV and on YouTube. As always, thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>